lecturer in the School of Media Art and Design. Um, but some of you may know that I had a former life as a puppeteer. Um, and so for over a decade, myself and my wife Sonia, um, who's here, we formed the group Theatre of the Small, which was largely the two of us and sometimes metro musicians. And we travelled around historic houses and festivals, that sort of thing, um, with, a kind of, with a small repertoire of puppet shows. But occasionally we would do more kind of experimental pieces. And this chap is the result of one of those experimental pieces. Um, he's called Frank, as you'll gather from the title of this talk. And say hello to everyone, Frank. <laughs> or just wave. <laughs> he has a detachable head, as you can see. <laughs> um, and he was for um, a festival, the, um, a festival which we organised called uh, the Winter Tales Festival. I've got some notes here, so I remember what I was going to tell you. Um, which was, uh, took place in Sandwich in 2007. It was a one-off performance with a storyteller, Tony Cooper, and so what would happen is myself and my wife, we played two quite dodgy characters um, who dragged, we both dragged Frank on by his feet and put him on a table and we started dissecting him. The idea was that we were a bit like resurrection men or um, who used to rob graves for anatomy lessons or a bit like um, Heron Burke who in Edinburgh in, the date here, 1828 um, actually mur murdered for the purpose of anatomy lessons. They discovered they could make a quick buck. So we're kind of non-specifically that kind of dodgy character. Um, so we started dissecting him, and we would come up with objects would appear as we dissected him. And the objects would then prompt a story. Yeah, and so it went on like that for a while. And I can check, well, I haven't got many of the objects left, actually, but there's some of the objects which you can pass around. <laughs> so that would have prompted one story. There was also a, um, I can't, was it his leg or his arm bone? I think it was his leg bone was, was actually a flute. So it was a sort of bone that you could play. <laughs> prompted something. And there was another moment where we took an arm off and we, we had candles behind it so it looked like we were lighting the fingertips. It was the hand of glory. Um, Frank was a sort of throw-together construction. Um, I made him very quickly, just out of scraps of wood. He's actually made, the inside of him is made from an old office chair. Um, and his head and his hands are carved out of um, Indonesian gelatin wood. I managed to acquire a load of Indonesian gelatin wood. This is what they make the um, puppets out of in Indonesia. And it's, very, it's actually very easy to carve, and it's quite, it's quite lightweight. So as he was dissected, he would also kind of spill things. So we, I stuffed his head with the shavings that came out of his head. And so when we took the head apart, the shavings would sort of pour out. So you'd have this sort of mess all around the, um, all around the table. The final story, I don't even remember what the final story was, but it, it um, prompted a sort of resurrection of Frank. So he was a sort of dead being, and then he became a living being. And I thought it was probably worth, at this point, asking my accomplice up, and we will attempt to animate Frank. For the first time, actually, in an entire decade, he hasn't been animated like this. He doesn't animate quite in the way that he used to, because he used to have two, the arms would go out like that, zombie-like, but only one of them was going to go out. So we get to a point. He's got a lot more equipment, yeah. And I'll explain why he's got a lot more equipment. So he goes up. Oh. Are you doing legs? That. And he walked towards the audience right at the culmination. Sitting down over here. <laughs> God, this <is> heavy. <laughs> right. There we are.
I can show you what it used to look like. So in the slide here, he, um, <laughs> he had different clothes originally. He had very sort of tatty clothes. Um, he's now dressed as a soldier, and all will become clear. Um, I've actually got a very short bit of film footage, which we made as a sort of trailer um, for it at the time, and I'll, I'll show you that very quickly. And then I'll talk a bit of theory, and then we'll come back to Frank. Bear with me, we've been struggling a bit with this. Um... Oh no, it's lost it again. <laughs> it's lost to YouTube again. Yeah. Uh... How do you drag them in your house? I don't know how you drag it. Oh, okay, that's weird. Okay, full screen and we'll. Um... I'll start that from the beginning again. Sorry, there it is. Sorry, can you do it? Because I'm, yeah, I've not used this sort of platform before. The sliding across things totally thrown me. I should have just bought my Mac. <laughs> Um, that thing. 
Um, I'm going to start with Sigmund Freud and what he says about the uncanny. That's what he says about the uncanny. Um, for him, the feeling of the uncanny is a feeling of eeriness, unfamiliarity, what he calls unheimlich, which is the unhomely. And that's, but also, paradoxically, it's also something that's familiar and homely at the same time. Yeah? Um, so there is a sort of familiarity, but there's something unsettling about that familiarity. It was often prompted, for Freud, it was often prompted by a recurrence of something. So an example might be a ghost or a haunting, something like that, is a recurrence of um, you know, an, a being or an image of a being. Um, and that recurrence would provoke, in the case of ghosts, fear of the dead. Um, such experiences, uncanny experiences, provoked a reaction for Freud in the unconscious and a return to deep-rooted, often collective, fears which had been repressed. Um, in discussing the automaton Olympia in Hoffman's story The Sandman, Freud referred to the doubt over whether an inanimate object was really alive or a lifeless object was animated. And it's that confusion which provoked the uncanny. And he said, do you see here, an uncanny effect often arises when the boundary between fantasy and reality is blurred. When we are faced with the reality of something that we have until now considered imaginable. When a symbol takes on the full function and significance of what it symbolises. So this is when the imaginary perhaps seemingly becomes real. You know it's imaginary, but it's doing things that, that you perhaps don't expect it to do. Frank as a puppet, perhaps to some degree tapped into that fear of the inanimate becoming animate. He represented an image of the dead uncannily resurrected. For a moment the dead and the inert seemed to have been given life and the audience reacted with a collective horror. However, Freud's theories, I don't think, explain why this should happen when the artifice of the animation or the puppetry can be clearly seen. Surely the unconscious mind should be able to adjust to the obvious trickery. But we cannot expect what he calls the return of the repressed to be a rational thing, to be a rational reaction. And we should perhaps look back to our childhood encounters of the animation of the inert. And that took me to looking at people like Baudelaire and uh, Rainy Maria Rilke. So Charles Baudelaire in 1853 observed how children will animate any object, but also felt that they would look for the soul in the toy, and that this, he said, is their first metaphysical stirring. Um, Rainy Maria Rilke further developed his suggestions and also used his writing to try and deal with his own fear of dolls. Children, he said, make an emotional investment in dolls, and thus they breathe life into them. Um, while knowing that, that behind the mask face of the doll, there is nobody there. For Rilke, the doll is a silent vessel, which we fill with our own incomprehension of being. He said, we mixed in the doll, as if in a test tube, everything we were experiencing and could not recognise. So behind the doll, there is a nothingness, which we fill with meaning. It becomes a signifier for the meaning of our own existence. More recently, the American puppeteer Roman Pasca discussed the puppet as hiding a profound nothingness. And this differs from the mask, which hides a living being. So in Pasca's words, the mask of an actor or dancer conceals a density of humanity. The puppet nothing but emptiness. For the animation theorist Alan Cholodenko, um, he was, he implied that the, well he felt that the, um, that animation always implied the inanimate, the dead, the suspended, or the inert. That the animation of a doll, a marionette, or an object through stop motion creates what he calls the illusion of life. The animated object works as a metaphysical signifier by nature of its, iner its evident inertness. Its seeming presence never ceases to be only seeming. If the illusion was entirely convincing, we would not take the object as a signifier, we would accept it as life itself. Rilke refers to this kind of soulless effigy, which is invested in human feeling, as the doll soul. 
And as he explains, he says, one could never quite say where you really were, whether you were at that moment in us or in that drowsy creature to whom we were constantly assigning you. Thus the doll, puppet or effigy is a signifier for an other self. It is empty of soul until we animate it with movement and therefore character. Puppets and dolls stand as signifiers. Their very point is that they are not living. They are objects used to signify otherness and emptiness. Outside of the moment of performance, the inert puppet, puppet is, in Pascal's writing, a dead thing, a poten potential signifier only. As an object, the puppet is reborn for each performance, rather than having the illusion of continuous character. However, it doesn't make sense to call the puppet a dead thing, I think, when it has never really been alive. Um, it is given the illusion of life, and therefore also the illusion of death when inert. So Frank, who's sitting there looking fairly inert at the moment, um, <laughs> um, Frank is both inert matter and also a sort of signifier of death. And he's a very obvious signifier of death because he's lacking a head and you can see his rib cage. Um, until he moves. And then the signification sort of changes. He can only signify death effectively by being a potential signifier for life. So if he was just an arrangement of clothes and um, bits of wood, he wouldn't signify anything very much, really. He certainly wouldn't signify um, death. But because he has the potential to move, he's a signifier for death when he's not. Does that make sense? Hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> Another way of understanding this inner effigy um, comes from the Jewish legend um, about golem. Now, the golem is a Hebrew word which means unformed, or simply it means matter rather than death. So, golem, or the state of golem, is the silent effigy waiting to be animated. Um, the biblical Adam, made from clay, um, is referred to in Kabbalistic literature as Golem, before he has life breathed into him by God. A puppet hanging lifeless in the theatre wings, or slumped in a box, or sitting on a chair, um, is in a state of Golem. The actual legend of the Golem um, comes from Prague in the Czech Republic, um, and it's been told and retold by both Jews and Christians um, since the Middle Ages. And in this legend, a figure, a golem, a golem, is modelled from clay and brought to life with a written spell which is inserted into its mouth. It rampages through the ghetto um, until the spell is removed and it returns to inert matter again. This tale figure prefigures some of the themes in Shelley's Frankenstein um, and the golem, Frankenstein's monster, and actually I think Collodi's Pinocchio all speak of the chaotic dangers of the artificial animation of matter let loose. The puppeteer does more than simply move objects, but seems to breathe life into them. In conveying a character to the audience, the puppeteer calls into being or summons a seemingly living presence, regardless of the obvious artifice. Puppetry is a way of conjuring the inert or lifeless into life. It is a kind of occult summoning, an awakening of the doll soul um, that we knew in childhood, empty of consciousness, but full of significant meaning. Um, but unlike these sort of legends and stories, um, we are safe knowing that the puppeteer still controls the puppet. It is not let loose, it is not on the rampage, that only happens in stories. Although Anatomy of a Story um, was quite successful, it was a one-off performance, it was a successful one-off performance, um, we didn't develop the um, show further, we were overtaken by other projects. So for a decade, Frank um, moved from one corner of my workshop to another. For a short time, he was propped up in a corner, but when I was working in my workshop, I'd be constantly um, sort of, well, just jumpy, seeing him at the corner of my eye. Yeah? Oh, who's that? Um, 
he seemed to have a presence. So he ended up, you know, stuffed in a bag under a table, or eventually ended up in a tea chest. Um, so perhaps, you know, I hadn't put his dog soul to rest <laughs> adequately, but just propped him up in the table. However, I did keep the head and the hands would, would sort of sit on the shelf. They didn't seem to, you know, the dog soul didn't seem to be in these at all, but the full body sitting there seemed to have a presence, even without the head, and I found that a sort of puzzling thing. Um, maybe because the head has no eyes. You've got the eyes somewhere, pass them around. Um, he can't see you. It's okay. It's all safe. Hasn't got the eyes that follow you around the room. Um, he briefly um, made an appearance in the Margate Shell Grotto. Um, he was dragged from, we did a Halloween event there, so we did a puppet show in the, in the Shell Grotto, and we dragged him by his feet all the way through the length of the Shell Grotto up to the cafe area, um, which also looked quite sinister, but he wasn't animated at that point, he really was just an inert, you know, symbol of death. Um, and he was resurrected once again quite recently. Um, for the Canterbury Players production of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. I was asked um, to take part in Sleepy Hollow um, because I had a wooden horse. I've got a couple of wooden horses and this is the subject of my PhD and it's, um, it's an old East Kent tradition of wooden horse. It would go around to pubs and houses at Christmas, um, taken around by stable lads and they would ask for money, drink, that sort of thing. And traditionally, um, people would try and ride the hooden horse. Didn't really have a play, people would jump on its back and fall off again. Yeah? So that's what we sort of brought into the play. So Ichabod Crane tries to ride this um, grumpy horse, Gunpowder, and he gets thrown by it several times. Um, good job we were only doing it for three nights because he did hurt himself every time. <laughs> um, and in fact, one time he ended up really close to the edge of the stage. It was one of those moments. Um, so that's what I was asked to bring to the show. But then um, the director said, um, well, what should we do about the headless horseman then? Um, and of course, I remembered that I had a headless um, man sitting in the workshop all this time. Um, and so, inspired by um, things like, I don't know if anyone's seen the Padstow Hobby Horse, that kind of construction. Um, I've actually got a couple of hobby horses, which we used to use as puppeteers in a hobby horse joust, to get children to joust one another. The sort of hobby horses, you, you wear them around your waist, they're usually called tawny horses. And so I had this idea of um, putting the, the, the sort of body of the horse actually on my shoulders and then putting Frank on top. Um, and so that is what happened. And then we see him um, reaching for Ichabod Crane. <laughs> um, and uh, and I think to um, to sort of finish this first part of this um, to finish this talk, I'm going to actually um, get on and just have a quick <laughs> throw this around so you, you get an idea, and you can tell me what kind of presence it has. It doesn't have. Right. So we're going to have to put Frank on. So we're going to have to walk Frank on. So he's been redressed for this role. He's a hissing with cavalryman. Any questions while I'm putting his arm together? He already looks like a human. 
You already, yeah? yeah. <laughs> you already have that. Okay. Right. Yeah, if you could hold my foot as well. I was going to charge straight down the line there, but there's a camera. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see how that looks? Um, I'm not fast, but I'm just going to do There we go. Okay. <laughs> And that's the life and death, and life and death of a friend. <laughs> Any questions?
figures usually, and um, uh, usually slightly, uh, slightly too large or slightly too small. And, and uh, I had an uncanny moment um, uh, seeing uh, uh, one of the larger Royal New um, uh, where you, you know very well that it is just an art object. It kind of goes, goes past art, but you know it's just an object. And you stand in front of it in all the contexts that say art. This is not going to move. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And yet, there was a moment where uh, I thought, Christ is breathing. It's really <laughs> odd. Yeah. Um, uh, and and, and I, I wonder if it's, it's almost like the reverse of what we were talking about. Right. Because, um, because the, all, there is no animation. Yeah. There is, but there are so many signifiers of animation. Apart, there are all the signifiers of imagination apart from the breathing. Yeah. So you've supplied the breathing. Well, you imagine. Yeah, yeah, I've had a similar experience with uh, Romney Oaks. Uh, I think, I don't, was it Romney Oaks work in the Turner Contemporary? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, no, it was it was it was else. Else. Yeah, slightly else, but oh. yeah, similar, similar kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that was the body on the floor. Yeah, the, the that was Jeremy Miller's. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's, it's puzzling, isn't it? Yeah, the, there's, some, there's something else going on. Yeah. Right? Your, your, um, the movement, the, the, literally the animation, is making you believe it's alive, I animated. Yeah. <laughs> Without that, it is just a, yeah. some stuff. Yes, visually, you don't expect that to move, do you? It's no. just it, unlike a wrong movie. Yeah, it looks like it's going to move. And then it does. Yeah, and this has that, kind of, that, this has that inertness which, where it just turns into just materials. Is there something in like uh, Is there something in real I'm not, I, I don't know about this, but I, yeah. I, this is, this is you know, as usual with me, yeah. something that somebody's told me that somebody else did. Um, but is there something in Rilke about the doll that, that the, more, the more realistic the doll, the less likely it is to give back or, 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 um, or allow the child to take back its emotions that it's put into them? Right. Is there, is, is there I don't remember him saying anything along those lines. But there is a short story where there's a kind of confusion between a dead child and a puppet, um, which is, um, and the appearance of the dead child actually puts the, the audience into a level of panic, mm -hmm. which they didn't have before. Um, so he, made, he does make a distinction, I think, between realism mm -hmm. and these sort of yeah, puppet constructions. Um, but I'm not sure really, yeah. Mm. He doesn't seem to say, say that one is more creepy than another. Levels of uncanny. Levels of uncanny. The first yeah. wrong view anyone ever saw was that dead dad in the sensation. Yeah. Which was literally, you thought it was a dead, you thought it was a dead being. So it is the reverse, it's the reverse of what we were talking about, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think when you mentioned the being in your workshop in the corner for you was somebody turning <laughs> attention to it because you thought someone was there. That's right. That's a sort of overlap with uh, the encounter with one of his refugees and the wax figures. Yeah. Isn't it? The, the, there's an anecdote about Freud who was on a, a railway train and he went into a sleeping carriage and suddenly he was confronted by an old man and uh, he realised a moment later, he was staring at himself in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an interesting <laughs> example of the uncanny. Because yeah. The problem is that we are like animated lumps of flesh. Yeah. You know, so that, that we're constantly on the lookout for that, how somebody's animated, there are certain sort of norms that um, are associated with you know, a normal human being. Yeah. But that, that, that idea of introducing the notion of Dead child, and then yeah. bring the child into the state that's really uh, potent, isn't it? It is, yeah. and then it's going to be very, very unsettling because that exchange between the dead body and the inert yeah. and the animated human is, is articulated. Yeah. I think it's also, there's yeah, the theories, more recent theories about the uncanny valley have a lot to do with where it's this sort of sliding scale, isn't there? That the more realistic the 
the being, yes, the more a sense of the uncanny you get. And this, yeah, I think this come, is what you're getting at. Mm. Um, and it's theory that was developed in relation to artificial intelligence. So the idea that the more, the more realistic you make a robot, the more disturbing people find it. Um, it's got to be absolutely spot on for you to, or, or not look like a human being at all for you to kind of accept it. Um, but it's, if it's almost human, it's more disturbing than anything, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. The almost human. The almost human, yeah. I think in visual context, the moment when the first book Frank over here, the first thing that came to my mind was the US humans are animated. And that idea in itself, I think, is much harder for us to deal with than the concept of Frank. Yeah. Because we don't want to encounter the kind of people that might animate their projects. Yes, <laughs> that's right. You don't want um, to meet the kind of people we were <laughs> playing, no. So I think that that problem is still there quite strongly. And then when you see Frank comes from the courts, yeah. he's holding his own presence yes. quite differently. Yeah. And so there's something quite different about the encounter with Frank in those um, few yeah. contexts. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it's, a, uh, it's about theatricality. You know, as soon as you stepped inside, I forgot you were there. Uh, yeah. um, and I, I, I was only looking at um, yeah. Frank, which I, I found really interesting. Do you feel that you become part of the puppet? Or? Not really, actually. No. Um, you're just desperately trying to see. <laughs> <laughs> um, and have some sense of space. You lose all your sense of space around you, really. You know, you kind of lose that. Um, so I don't think you do become a puppet with this kind of puppet. I think perhaps other kinds of puppets you, you do channel more directly into the, into the, the object. Um, but with something like Missy, he's just trying to <laughs> hold it together. Um, but it is interesting, when we were rehearsing with him, I'd have to bring him along to every single rehearsal um, because um, the actors needed the presence. They didn't, you know, they, they actually needed the physical. We can just pretend we actually had to have it there. Um, and then when they'd refer to me, they'd kind of look up at this headless thing to, to talk to. Can you just get him to move uh, over there? There's no head to look at. <laughs> so it causes confusions. Um, it's a little easier. I think with the wooden horse, I feel more part of it. I'm much closer in, you know, I'm, I'm actually very close to the head. People do refer, talk up to the, up to the head instead of to me. Um, but I think it's the nature of, I'm perhaps more of the horse actually than him. I'm trying to be horse-like. <laughs> yeah. Do, do, do you see this as particularly related to puppetry? I, I'm just thinking about the two things struck me first of all. One of them is the existence of cold presences on the internet. Where, where effectively you have people who don't exist, who actually ah, don't exist. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, there's really important cases like that, like mm. the police creating cold presences in order to uh, infiltrate uh, subversive um, organisations and that sort of thing. But there's another little bit which I think is really poignant, which is a little bit in um, uh, the new Blade Runner film, where one of the most touching moments is a relationship between. Uh, a replicant yeah. uh, and a hologram. Oh. It's, it's beautifully sort of uh, okay. t tender moments. Yeah. Even though the audience is entirely aware that this is a hologram and yeah. a replicant yeah. involved in it. And that's one of Philip Dick's sort of themes, isn't it? It's about yeah. how, as it were, the puppet is more human than humans are. Yeah. That's the notion which is. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I think we're into kind of the realm of ghosts. Oh, with these, these presences on the, on the internet, which are, there's no one behind it. Um, I'm, I'm, not sure that, no, I'm not sure that you are, really. I think you're, you're dealing with an aspect of what human beings... I mean, there's some, there's some um, figure which I cannot remember about how many um, Facebook um, profiles that are thought to be are made up yeah. you know, by, by people in order to... Uh, so it's something which is, it seems to me is very human. I mean, I yeah. suppose that's making profits. It's yeah. In terms of control, so. Yeah. I suppose it's I'm thinking something ghost-like about it because it is a trace of someone. You have their voice, you have their, but they're disconnected from the being. It has kind of no ontological presence, and yet it seems to. Um, and that I think is sort of ghost-like. Whereas with the puppet, it, you know, it's a, it's a physical being. It's a well, physical, not being, is it? Physical thing um, that you're dealing with. It inhabits.
is a space. It does have a kind of ontological presence, you know, that's the, the, the kind of existence of wood and materials and so on. Um, but I think equally interesting and uh, potentially uncanny. Mm. Yes? Yes, I've got a question. What's going to happen to Chisel Hall's friend next? I see it. Where's he going? He's going back into Teachester. He's, well, I think the immediate, um, the immediate destination is the Teachest. He hasn't got, he hasn't got any kind of career plans at the moment. <laughs> so I think he's um, Yeah. But the horse is going to be dismantled um, tonight or maybe tomorrow. Um, because we're doing an event at the weekend here, we're plugging an event. Um, because there's still a few hours left to buy tickets <laughs> Which is the Feast of Fools for your sandwich. And there's going to be, the hobby horses are going to be performing in the, in the Feast of Fools. So we need this hobby horse back. <laughs> okay. Right, shall I hand over to you? Oh, there's another one. Uh, Right, so we hand over to our next speaker.